Welcome to the Inside Silverstone podcast, a business-focused podcast covering all things tech, engineering and innovation. Hosted by me, Chris Broom, a huge tech, motorsport and gaming fan and also the owner of Longhurst, a firm of lifestyle financial planners and independent financial advisors located in Silverstone, Northamptonshire. This is a series of unscripted and unpolished conversations with leading business owners, thought leaders and high-tech talent where we discuss their experiences within the Silverstone business and motorsport region. We will also be asking them to share their knowledge, insight and their thoughts on the future just for you. If you're looking to learn more about the Silverstone high growth region and commercially connect with like-minded peers, you've definitely come to the right place. Welcome to Inside Silverstone. Welcome to the next edition of Inside Silverstone. My name is Chris Broom and I am your host. Today I am delighted to welcome to the show for a one-to-one interview, Lena Gade from Multimatic Inc, where you are a vehicle dynamic manager and race engineer, but also, and as importantly, the first female race engineer to win Le Mans. Lena, welcome to the show. Hello, Chris. You're very enthusiastic right now. Oh, you're less enthusiastic by that introduction. Come on, Lena. You are the first female race engineer to win Le Mans. That must be worth a celebration. Come on. Anyway, thank you so much for coming on the show, Lena. Um, uh, I do too. Like we, we had you on uh, alongside some some other phenomenal, awesome females and ladies where we did uh, an International Women's Day focus uh, at Silverstone um, at the British Racing Drivers Club where we were talking about um, uh, females in uh, women in engineering. So thanks for doing that. And as I said, thank you for coming on this one-to-one interview where I promise to be as gentle as I possibly can, where we sort of just talk about you and focus on you and your career and obviously where you're working at the moment and what you guys are up to. So to start start off as I always do Lena I love to run through a bit of a career snapshot if that's okay so our wonderful dear listeners can understand sort of where you started and obviously where you are now so is that okay if I run through that yep cool right so nice and easy the first one of the first places you worked at were our friends at Delta Motorsport based on Silverstone Park so um so presumably that was one of your first roles as an engineer yeah, so um, I, after graduating from university, I actually didn't go directly into motorsport because um, I didn't have any experience. Um, I ended up going to Jaguar for a short stint, um, and uh, that was actually quite a good thing to do. I worked in MBH for a little while. Um, that gave me a chance to learn about the automotive industry, automotive concepts and things like that, because I graduated with a degree in aerospace cool. um, engineering. Um, and after... I mean, I, I didn't really want to do automotive because I'd always wanted to be in motorsport since I was about 13 or 14. Um, so it was kind of a in-between step. Let's go with that. Yeah. Um, but it did, having the, the day job did give me a chance to do lots of um, work for free for at least the beginning of my motorsport career in Formula V and Formula BMW. Slowly having made some contacts, I then ended up um, doing some uh, work for a team who went to Le Mans. And it was the first year that Audi were there. Um, in 2006 with the, with the diesel engine car and um, having seen them racing over there via my contacts in the team I was able to speak with some of the engineers who worked for Audi and pretty much never looked back after that but right at the beginning of my time with Audi because I was still a contractor I was able to work for other teams and stuff and that's how I ended up with Delta specifically on um, Super Formula which doesn't exist anymore um, you know football teams and motorsport interesting mix but it was really good fun the cars were the cars were quite unique um i mean they were huge to be honest and um it was a fun series but just like everything in this business when there's not a lot of money it's not really going to survive and i don't really remember what the story was behind behind super league but after a couple of years it wasn't there anymore no more but um so so delta motorsport supernova champion racing Audi Sport, where you then had uh, a long, decent stint at Audi Sport. So talk to us about Audi Sport, what you did there, and and how we can link that to Le Mans and and clearly your success there. Yeah, so um, back in 2006, as I was quitting from Myra, um, I got to meet Howden Haynes, and that was through the team contact that I had for the um, guys at Chamberlain Synergy, who I was working for at the time as a data engineer. And um, when I I met H... (laughs) I didn't actually know that he was going to speak to me about the hour, a position that he needed to help him with um, a, 
at Audi Sport and specifically Champion Racing out in the States, we were talking about a GT3 Jaguar and it was based on the XK8 because I'd done a little bit of work on that car. I was like, oh, I'd really love to work on this project. Mm. And then he started to show me some stuff from the Audi side of things because he had a bit of a brief conversation. Would you be interested in doing some data side of things for um, a sports car team that's out in the US? And uh, at that stage, I, was, I realized, oh, that, that's that car that was at Le Mans a couple of months back. Mm. <laughs> and um, effectively, one thing led to another. And from 2007 onwards, I started working for um, actually Champion um, with H. We were out to the States every couple of weeks doing the, at the time, the American Le Mans series with the R10. Um, first drivers that um, I worked with from Audi Sport were Dindo Capello and Alan McNish. Nice. Yeah, and so obviously I knew Alan from Toyota days in F1. And I just remember that when I first met him, I was like, wow, he really is really is quite short. Not that I'm that tall, um, but also that um, I've been watching the Japanese Grand Prix the year that um, his car had gone over the barrier and he got stuck upside down. And because the qualifying was being shown live in the UK, I'd woken up really early to watch it. And because it was delayed and I had to go to my Saturday job, I wasn't able to watch the rest of the qualifying. So I wasn't very happy with him. It took me a while to tell him that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I ended up with them. Um, 2007, 2008, working um, with ALMS and with H over there as his assistant race engineer. And um, also in 2008, we competed in Europe in um, the Le Mans series. Um, and that was my first Le Mans in 2008 with Audi Sport. And our car won that year. H was engineering. Um, that was another, that was actually the, the basis of the 24, Truth in 24 film that um, became pretty, pretty legendary. Nice. Um, and after after about three and a half years with them and having been involved in a lot of the base work that um, Team Yoast, Audi Sport and Champion did um, in 2010 after Le Mans, um, I was asked if I wanted to, to do some race engineering and was promoted into a race engineer. So that is how that bit started. Yeah. And then come 2011, so after three races as a race engineer, sort of like giving it a go, and is it is it really what you want to do? Because it's quite different to being the assistant on the car. Yeah. Um, I then did three races in 2011, the third one being the mom. And at the time, things hadn't been going very well. The previous two races had been pretty disastrous. <laughs> um, I was uh, convinced that I was going to get fired because <laughs> uh -huh. I basically run the car out of fuel twice <laughs> in each race, one at Sebring, one at Spa. Each time the car made it back to the pits, but God, that wasn't good. Um, and then after, after uh, the Le Mans win that year, which sort of came a little bit um, out of the blue to some extent because there, was, there were the three Audis, four Peugeots, and the first two Audis were out within the first you know, 12 hours of the race. And then it was all left to the rookie crew because we were all rookie engineers, rookie drivers. <laughs> uh, it was only rookie drivers to Audi Sport, let's say. And then um, some fairly inexperienced mechanics. I don't know what the Audi team were thinking behind us. They must have been like, oh my God, this can't go like um, Sebring and Spa did. But we came out of it having won it. And then it was a bit like, oh, maybe I shouldn't quit. Maybe I might be okay at this. So you say that, and you're, like, you're so, so relaxed, but you, you won Le Mans 24 hours, and you were the first race female race engineer to do that. I mean, that must be, what was that like? What was that feeling like? So honestly, at the time, because um, it's close to 10 years now, yeah. um, at the time, I wasn't even aware of what it meant. And it took yeah. probably about three months for it to fully sink in to kind of go, oh, wow, that was a really big deal, actually. We won Le Mans. Yeah. Um, it's, ever, it's only since then that um, things, uh, getting out of hand is the wrong expression, but things have sort of exploded since then with there being a lot of interest in who I am, what my career has been. Um, and certainly the year after in 2012 was the first year of the WEC. So um, as one of the race engineers in that series, which being an FIA series and a world championship was a big, big deal. And it was on, it was during the up period of hybrids um yeah. in sports cars um it started to get um what's the word i guess it was a little bit overwhelming at first yeah, um 
and annoying because um, I don't see it as a big deal whatsoever. I think if anyone had been in my shoes, I'd like to think that they took all the opportunities that were given to them and they made a success of it because Audi was not one of the easiest places to work. And that's only because the pressure to win was so high. Um, you have to be fully committed to, to doing the job. And if you're fully committed, you walked away with the results. It was really, really simple equation. So for me, anyone could have been able to do this. I couldn't see the big deal in it being a woman. Subsequently, though, I think I realized how much um, it actually does mean to a lot of up and coming engineers and certainly young, younger people. And I mean that as both male and female, because yes. it's just as important for, for boys and for young men to realize that women can be a part of motorsport in fields like engineering, mechanicking, um, all of the areas that have traditionally been seen as very male dominated. And if they think it's normal, then that makes it a little bit easier for people to accept that there is a career to be had in it and for women to come in and, and have, make a good job of it. Here, here. And, and what's equally cool is that when you left Audi, they then gave you the trophy that everybody yeah, won, they did. won, right? And so we won't turn your camera around, but to your left-hand side is a massive... Le Mans trophy, which, yeah. which, you, which you told me you clean every day, you said, because that's how proud of it you are. Um, I want to say I clean it every day, but I don't. <laughs> uh, it gets polished every so often, but it's in a room upstairs, hidden from <laughs> view to some extent, because it's so priceless. Sure. No, it's amazing, and congratulations again. It's, it's immensely impressive, but I can understand your point about it being overwhelming, at, you know, and, and, and you get annoying people like me having it up. Going, it's really good news, it's really good news, because ultimately it is, and as you said, and rightly so, if it can inspire the next generation of engineers, uh, you know, gender of whatever, female, male, whatever, then, then that's, that, that's what it's designed to do, right? Um, yeah. That's another reason why I should come on, so... So Audi Motorsport, you then worked, did, did um, joined the Bentley Motorsport team uh, for a year, and then um, and then shortly after that joined Multimatic. And so we'll get, we're going to come on to Multimatic in a second. Uh, but then at the beginning of this year, you then became the president of the GT Commission. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, concise nutshell, what is that? What does that mean? Because that to me sounds really really impressive, and presumably that's to do with the GT3 series or something yes. similar to that. Yeah, so the GT Commission has existed for a number of years. Um, the previous president was um, Christian Schacht, who is part of the DMSB, um, which is the German equivalent of, of the FIA or the ASN from, from Germany. Um, and GT3 racing, I think we all know the history of it. Um, the SRO were really responsible initially for the GT3 coming along as a homologated car. It um, sits in, with the FIA. Um, and I was asked at the end of last year if I wanted to be the president um, uh, because Christian was uh, stepping down. I will say that the day they asked me, I was returning from Paris, having had an evening out with Andre, Ben and Marcel, my three drivers from Audi, after they were inducted into the Hall of Fame. Nice. Our evening ended at 3 a.m. Nice. And I was feeling a bit worse for wear. Um, and I did actually say to the FIA at the time, look, I'm going to have to run this by um, my senior management at Multimatic because there could be a direct conflict there. Um, in effect, the commission itself looks after the interests of GT3 racing globally. So there's um, lots of input from the different race series, um, whether it's representation from the DMSB for the racing in Germany or from IMSA because GTD, which is GT3 cars, are part of their championship. Um, it's all to kind of look forward to what sort of racing could be coming our way and how to handle um, the various different challenges that exist because um, everyone's got an idea of what it should uh, entail. Um, on the actual commission itself, we've only got um, two representatives that represent all the manufacturers. Um, but the technical working group and the sporting working groups can have anything up to 17 OEMs involved. So it's pretty major. Um, it's also one of the more healthy of the series, um, certainly because it's customer racing. Um, it's also, as I say, got its own unique challenges, but there's a very big focus on trying to make sure that it remains focused on customer racing, that it remains healthy and that it's something that manufacturers still support because racing 
um, today is very different to what it was 30, 40 years ago uh -huh. um, when it was seen as being a necessity to some extent to an OEM's profile, whereas these days that's a little different. Um, there's so many different other sports you can be involved in, even virtually, uh -huh. that um, actually having cars um, out racing, it has to be commercially viable. So the commission represents some of that. And it's quite interesting talking to all those people because everyone's got very different ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, what a time to become president and a few months later, COVID kicks in, right? No, it's awesome. Thank you, Christian. It's <laughs> <laughs> zipping you. It's zipping you. But I, I must say, from a GT3 perspective, certainly as a fan, um, I took my eldest brother to uh, last race last year at Silverstone and uh, uh, my eldest brother's uh, handicap and uh, but he just completely fell in love with it and uh, it was so accessible for him from a fan perspective clearly a, a lot easier for him to, to, to be able to go and watch the, the race uh, versus you know going to watch the F1 for example so yeah. you know, I certainly say from a fan perspective the buy-in was, was fantastic and we're going to make that a family thing now every year because oh, that's cool. he, because he completely loved it so um, and it's equally great that we now know the president of the GT commission so <laughs> very good I am so teasing so right anyway right moving on to so actually what you do sort of day-to-day -day predominantly um multimatic so for those that haven't heard of multimatic certainly those that aren't part of uh, sort of engineering world or motorsport world as such um uh, what do multimatic do so who, who are you what, what's the sort of snapshot of what you guys do so there's actually a lot of people who haven't heard of multimatic it's quite under the radar to some extent um probably the most um recognizable thing they've done is the ford gt um, yeah. the race car and uh, the actual road car. There was a lot of engineering development that went into that. That's what they're known for. Yeah. But basically the company started um, back in 1984. It's fully a uh, private global corporation. It's headquartered in Toronto, so it's actually Canadian, um, but they've got bases worldwide. Um, a couple of them based here in the UK. I work for um, the engineering section of the group um, in Thetford, which is basically near Snetterton, okay. quite far away from where I actually live in London. Yes. Um, the actual company itself is split into four different groups. There's mechanisms, um, structures and suspension, engineering and niche vehicles. And um, my part comes under engineering. A lot of motorsport comes under engineering as well. Um, and basically, we provide services or products and parts to any OEM tier one motorsport organization um, and it's everything from suspension components like control arms to mechanisms that control um, active aerodynamics that's on a few actual niche production cars at the moment uh -huh. um, to our own damper technology it's a patented um, system um, called dssv which is on a lot of race cars as well as oem products um, and we then do, certainly in Thetford, a lot of our focus is on vehicle CAE, FEA, design, development, testing, um, attribute development, that kind of thing. And it's both sort of component level and whole vehicle. The area I work in, which is the Vehicle Dynamics Centre, we've got three, effectively three test rigs. One's um, a driver in the loop simulator. It's a full motion, six degree of freedom system. The other one's um, something that we're really well known for, which is our four post rig. Um, it's actually technically six posts. I still haven't worked out why we call it four posts. The extra two posts over the aerodynamic loads that it adds. And basically, um, we've got our own post processing routines and it's our own um, uh, intellectual property. We have something called a performance index and we use it to, to help customers set up the ver vertical dynamics of their cars. So whether it's a change in damping, springs, or the balance thereof, mm. um, it's very unique to us. We don't do track replays, something that you commonly find on seven post rigs where you can replay a track like Silverstone or Barcelona or something like that. And you can uh -huh. tune your vehicle for that um, sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, and we've had that. I might get the dates wrong now, but it, it's basically been um, something that was developed since the late 80s when active suspension was um, pretty prevalent in Formula One. Um, it was done by a chap called Dave Williams, who is an absolute legend. Um, and the system that he created in effect was to be able to replay 
um, inputs, vertical inputs to um, the race car so that they could do all of their suspension tuning on it. And we've kept it ever since then and developed it further. Um, and the other new thing that we have, my latest new toy, nice and expensive, is a kinematic sync compliance rig. And um, really that's um, to do a lot of low frequency um, suspension characterization. And that's to understand the kinematics and the compliance of your car so you know how the kinematics behave with given inputs for camber, for steering geometry, and then how soft or stiff your car is um, to help you set it up. And it's used by OEMs, I hope, and uh, motorsport teams. Motorsport teams would use it if they had a change in, let's say, tyre supplier or con construction or compound. Uh -huh. um, and the OEMs generally tend to use it for benchmarking, characterization, and then making sure that once their first mules come along, um, they're matching their their predictions and what they had simulated a few years back. So, lots of toys. That's a lot of toys. And so, just for those that are listening to this or watching that aren't aware of the term, so what's an OEM? Um, a major manufacturer, so someone like Ford or uh, McLaren, Bentley, VW, something okay. like that. And what's tier one? Tier ones are suppliers like um, Lear, Magna. They produce things like uh, instrument panels and seats seats and stuff like that for automotive companies. There's something that, although it might be designed by the automotive um, manufacturer itself, they're produced by somebody else and then sold back into the program. Okay, cool. And so from a, so Multimatic, from a, from a business perspective, so they serve, as, as you said, so REM, so major car manufacturers, Ford, et cetera, uh, presumably d designing the cars that we drive, um, at, but yeah. then also you're involved in different race series um uh, as well right through yeah so through, from f1 through to gt through to yep. indycar through to whatever yeah so um the technology in the dssv damper that's something that is seen quite widely through motorsport um it's the spec damper in dtm at the moment mm. um for as long as dtm lasts um it's on a few uh, it was on um, a few Formula E products, um, obviously the Ford GT. There's other customers of ours who are in WEC um, across the whole spectrum um, from each category that are using it. And then out in the States, I mean, the Mazda DPI is something that was designed and developed um, by the engineers at Multimatic. Um, so that car also has DSSVs on it and there's dampers all over the place literally all over the place well, what led you to get into engineering because you, you everything you're explaining there just sounds phenomenal and clearly lots of career success and race success and and obviously an integral part of multimatic but what was your what's the genesis what was the first thing you ever remembered about me mechanics or engineering or cars or whatever um, it is that led you to, to where you are now do you think so i'd say um as a kid um my mum and dad were very very keen on us to just always have a good education and learn stuff our own way. So um, for a short period of time, we had lived in India. Um, they tried to emigrate back and um, things hadn't worked out. So we came back to the UK. But during that time, um, the entire system is completely different over in India. So we'd been going to school in the morning shift, which meant leaving the house at 6 a.m. and you'd be back after lunch. You'd have the afternoon to yourself, um, do a bit of homework. But the area we lived in used to have the water and the electricity turned off quite often. <laughs> so there's no entertainment. It was back in the, the 80s. So we couldn't just turn the TV on and watch something. Um, and we take stuff apart. And this is with my two younger sisters. Um, not really the youngest one. She was quite, she was quite small. She was three or four at the time. But Tina, my middle sister, is only three years younger than me. So um, we'd be quite interested in how the video worked or the radio worked and then why there were spares. Um, but in addition to that, my mum and dad were pretty strict about toys. If we broke them, it was our job to repair them. So we kind of got to this stage where we, it was just natural for us to pull out spanners and screwdrivers and things and have a look at how things functioned. And um, whilst we were still living out there, our parents introduced us to some of their family friends whose son was an engineer. And when he told us what he did, we're like, wow, that sounds quite interesting. Both of us wanted to be engineers. So I must have been... 10 Tina would have been seven and then we came back to the UK 
And a few years after being back in the UK, um, Tina was always a bit of a tomboy. She ha- used to hang out with her friends from a school from before she went away to India. And they were all into F1. So it was the days of PK, Prost, Senna, Mansell. And they told us to start watching this thing called F1. And up until this point, we had no idea about motorsport. Mm. We just watched it on the TV. Um, legendary James Hunt and Murray Walker are the commentators. I mean, that does it, doesn't it? That's, that's you decided you want to be an engineer in motorsport. I mean, it's clearly that simple. And what does Tina, what does your sister do now? She's now working for Alpha Tori um, in the simulation department. She's an engineer over there. Um, if you think my CV is impressive, hers is awesome. She's done everything from the land speed record JCB car to race engineering, um, some single seaters to rallying to sports cars to electric cars to all sorts. She's way more intelligent than me. Oh, I think you're doing yourself a disservice there. But, uh, I, I well, I feel time. stupid when I talk to her. So, oh, hold on. Let me rephrase that. She makes me feel stupid on purpose and then I get angry. Uh, but has she won the Mons? Um, no. Boom! <laughs> Wait, right. I'm trying to think back to which team she worked for. And if it, I know, I don't think she did. No, fine. So, you know, she hasn't got the trophy. So, anyway. Um, <laughs> Favourite race circuit? Oh, Spa. Yeah, not Silverstone. I'm teasing. Um, I'm teasing. I'm in teasing. England, it would be Silverstone. Of course, but Spa. But, why, why Spa? Oh, it's an awesome track. Um, apart from anything, it's not so straightforward to set up your car for the place. And when you get it right, the races there can just be so much fun, whether it's a 24-hour race um, with a GT3 car or whether it's a WEC race at the time with the LMP1 at the time. It, it was just brilliant, really brilliant. I love it. Um, removing your president hat for a second. What's your mm-hmm. favourite race series? Oh, no. At the moment? Yeah. This is a tough question. So I'd say the racing in IMSA is really good fun, um, but it's very different to European racing. If you're looking at European racing, I think, ooh, I'd say Formula E is pretty in- entertaining. Yeah. yeah what do you think the, the field is impressive. Yeah, what do you think the future of Formula E is? Um, well, <laughs> everything's sort of changed in the last couple of months, hasn't it? Um, yeah. Post-COVID. Post-COVID. Um, I'd say that there's going to be a lot of focus on um, the way people change, how they, how they travel. And yeah. with the way the oil industry has just tanked, <laughs> um, if they aren't thinking about alternative fuel sources... Well, I don't know who should be. Um, and they may well be thinking about alternative fuel sources that don't rely so heavily on fossil fuels. And apart from, just take the climate, you know, yeah. equ- uh, part, part of it out of the equation. Because let's face it, not everybody really cares about that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, there has to be a real change to the way we behave. Now, where does Formula E fit into all of this? I think it's been incredibly refreshing to have a series come along that has done something very different. Mm. Back in 2013 and 14, when it first was mooted about, everyone was like, oh, that's, that's, that's just rubbish. Why, do, why does anyone want to be involved in that? And what do you mean there's a car change in between? Well, have a look at it now. There is no mm. car change in between. Um, it's, it's a very, very technical series. It's probably one of the places next to F1 where you want to be if you want to see and be part of technical development that could have a future Uh, will it have one in two or three years time i hope so because i think it's important that it does exist will it be the only thing that exists personally i hope that um we do find um other alternative uh, alternatives to fuel um certainly fossil fuel and whether we remain with um racing as uh, let's say diluted as it is with all these series or not it doesn't really matter there's got to be a change that comes along so Let's see what the future holds. Good answer. Esports. What do you think about esports? So, until about three weeks ago, I hadn't watched any esports. <laughs> and then Lando um, Norris happened. Well, sort of. Actually, it was one of the guys that works um, in my department who used to do a bit of racing himself, and he took part in a mini challenge um, online race. And there were thirteen competitors in it. They were racing around Monza. And I think because I knew him and there was a bit of a link to somebody involved in the series, I really got into it. It was so entertaining. It was really good fun. Um, There's definitely a future there. I mean, just 
take everything aside, um, what we've seen over the last couple of months has been such a huge uptake in um, professional racing drivers taking part in eSports series, and not just F1. This is across the board, Formula E drivers, GT drivers, sports car drivers, a whole lot. And um, our, during a conversation in one of the commission meetings, um, we were told that there's been a five-fold increase in the purchase of simulators for one of the series. Right. And that alone should say that because there's such a huge future in it, it has got to form part of business models for motorsport. Just has to, because it allows so much more engagement um, for fans if they want to take part, yeah. but also the technology involved in just getting esports up and running. Forget the vehicle models that go in, but just yeah. the technology that's involved is phenomenal. Yeah. So there's a big, bright future there. Agreed. Yeah, I love it. And I'm a gaming geek myself. So, you How know, are you? <laughs> yeah, more, more power to it. So, that's one of the reasons I launched this podcast. It's like an interview people involved in gaming and motorsport and everything else. So, oh, right. uh, okay. happy days. Right. Well, I, I think we're, 30, we're about 30 minutes into this interview, I think, somehow. We're yeah. losing track of time. So, I told you to go very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't think we could fill 30 minutes or 20 minutes of course we can right some more questions three more questions and then we'll close yeah. it off and i'll let you get on with with what you're doing today um covid so what's the one thing you're looking forward to the most post covid when we're all free what's the one thing i really really wanted to go to the Saatchi museum to see um the tutankhamun exhibition nice. and i think that it's been extended it better have been extended for long enough that i can get there Done. That's well, one thing. We need to Google that and find out if that's the case. I'm sure it is. That must be. Yeah. You think so? Right. Embarrassing story or funny story. So I think I stumped you on this off air when we, were, when we were talking about it. So we like to share funny stories uh, or embarrassing stories or, or just something that's pertinent in, in, in something that you've done work wise. And to be fair, I think we've covered off a few. I think off air you were telling me about some sort of German commentator and surname. So what, what's that story? So there's a Eurosport commentator, and during the time that I was working at Audi, um, my surname is pronounced Gade um, here in England, and um, my dad had to adopt that. Back in India, it's pronounced Gadi, and people over here couldn't really pronounce it when he came across in the 60s, so he just settled on Gade. Let's leave it at that. Um, but this German commentator, live on air, decided that he knew better than everybody else. It must have been like 2013 or something like that. He knew better than everybody else. And he said, you know, that's not how you pronounce her surname. It's not Lena Gade. It's Lena Garda. Well, no, it isn't. It's Gade. No, no, it's Garda. No, well, if you want to say it like the Indians do, it's Garda. Uh, no, Garda. So till, till this day, a lot of them refer to me as Lena Garda. It's terrible. Did you ever correct him? Did he ever learn? I don't, I'm not even sure I, am, I met him, but I have to say I have the memory of a fish when it comes to meeting people. So just to set the record straight, if I meet you and I'm told your name, I can guarantee within two seconds I'm going to be like, uh-oh, oh, this isn't good. So if I did meet him, I probably didn't recognise who he was, and so I didn't correct him. Name badges, always a key, name badges. Always oh, yeah, key, I think that's a great idea. Right, last question, life advice. So we have... Um, a number of people listening to the show of different ages, including students who are based in some of the local technol technology colleges in and around Silverstone. So we always like to finish the interview with a question of saying, look, we'll take you back to when you're 18 years old, before your clearly impressive career, topped off in part with the Le Mans win, which I've said again, plus with <laughs> all the other cool stuff that you're doing and going to continue to do, including becoming president of the GT Commission, which is epic. What one bit of advice would you have given yourself back then? And it can't be not to do it. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. Um, what advice would I give? Probably the most important thing that I learned at my time in Audi um, was being able to admit mistakes, which everyone to some extent finds difficult to do but also to admit that you don't know everything. And that was really, really um, quite a significant, let's say, thing I had to, to understand because the cars were quite complicated, way more complicated than anything I'd ever worked on. And being able to know the ins and outs of every component, every system was virtually impossible. So I then had to make sure that the relationship I had with my fellow engineers, the trust that I had and 
um, relying on them for their expertise meant that I had to admit, well, I'm not going to know everything about it. I've got to rely on them so that we can get a good job done. I think that's fantastic advice. And I don't think you could be 18 to listen to that advice. I think, you know, I'm about to breach 40 and I think I could probably listen to that every now and again. So occasionally raise your hand and say, actually, I don't know the answer to that. So, I go through that every day. Yes. Yeah, you ask the guys at Multimatic, they're like, literally, she's the I don't know person. No, no, it's not that bad. But yeah, I think it's really, I think it's really important because um, even being at Multimatic with some of the really, really cool projects that are going on around us, there's some stuff that I just, I just don't get it, but I don't also know anything about it. And if someone was to ask me a question, it's almost better to say, actually, I don't know the answer to that, but I can point you in the direction of someone who does. So. Um, Lena, that's it. I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, for everybody Problem. listening to this, I'm going to include in the show notes some links to Multimatic and some other bits and bobs. So if you ever want to get in contact with them or with Lena, you can do so. Also, make sure you leave this show five-star reviews, please, on iTunes. So anybody with an iTunes account, certainly with an iPhone, look out for the purple podcast app. Search for Inside Silverstone. Give us a five-star review, and it means more and more people will listen to Lena around the world. Lena, thank you so much for coming on the show. No problem. Look to seeing you post-COVID. Take care. Look after the vegetable patch. Look after the cats. <laughs> look after next-door neighbor's cockerel. And I'll <laughs> We'll speak to you soon. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> The Inside Silverstone podcast is produced by the team at Longhurst for the benefit of those with a passion for all things tech, engineering and innovation. For more information, please visit longhurst.co.uk forward slash Inside Silverstone, whilst also remembering to give us a five out of five star rating on iTunes. Please note that neither Chris Broom or Longhurst work for Silverstone Park, Silverstone Circuit or Silverstone Technology Cluster. What we've seen over the last couple of months has been such a huge uptake in um, professional racing drivers taking part in esports series, and not just F1. This is across the board, Formula E drivers, GT drivers, sports car drivers, a whole lot. And um, our, during a conversation in one of the commission meetings, um, we were told that there's been a five-fold increase in the purchase of simulators for one of the series. Right. And that alone should say that because there's such a huge future in it, it has got to form part of business models for motorsport. Just has to because it allows so much more engagement um, for fans if they want to take part. Yeah. But also the technology involved in just getting esports up and running. Forget the vehicle models that go in, but just yeah. the technology that's involved is phenomenal. Yeah. So there's a big bright future there. <laughs>